you might like to explore what it's like to protect uh, and to continue to be mindful of, of the feeling of being restful, uh, pick other words, at ease, calm, quieter, tranquil, in the core of your being, even while potentially being interested, moving around a little bit, thinking, maybe writing something into the chat box with an inner stillness, deep, deep in the core of your being. That's a really interesting practice to, to keep developing in oneself. Uh, as I said at the beginning, and I wish we had said this to you in the email that went out today, so I apologize for that, but I wanted to change the schedule slightly and uh, do a slightly shorter meditation to allow slightly for questions and discussions. And I'm going to mute all again. Every so often it, it starts out that people are muted, but somehow in Zoom, something sneaks in and I don't know how it happens. We're still trying to figure it out. Probably Zoom is also, but anyway, that's what happened right there. So I'm gonna change the format a little bit tonight. And also I'm gonna do a combination of, uh, based on some polling we did last time, uh, both uh, opening it up for people to speak their questions, uh, hopefully succinctly and related to the topic tonight. And then also I will see what people type in, in the chat. I thought the feature was enabled that let people chat directly and privately to each other. For some reason that is not enabled this time. Uh, and I will figure out what happened there and we will fix that for the next time. Okay, so I'd like to talk with you about rest and tranquility. For one, how many of you, like me, in a way, long for rest? You know, <laughs> a chance to slow down, take a break, you know, have more room between activities of different kinds. <sighs> you might look around and see some of the hands that are raised and when people have their cameras on, like, wow, it would be so nice to come to rest. So I'd like to talk about this, both from the standpoint of the very penetrating and powerful teachings of the Buddha and modern neuropsychology and the understanding of what happens in the body when we do not let ourselves come to rest. And then I'll open it up for questions and, and really practical issues about how do we come to rest even in the middle of busy, busy activities. What's interesting and ironic these days is that a lot of us are kind of have had some of our busyness taken away from us. For in my case, I was going to be traveling a lot and I'm no longer involved with planes, trains and automobiles on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, we might feel that we have no time to ourselves because we're living closely with a bunch of other people that we may love, but we want some breathing room, right? So it's really interesting at this time. It's also an opportunity to use it amidst all the bad aspects of this time to look for some potentially good aspects, including the chance to just give up some of those old activities and come to a greater sense of rest. So it's in that context, I'd like to explore this topic with you. Uh, to begin, uh, you may know, as I mentioned in the beginning, that in Buddhism, uh, it is, you know, Buddhism is many things. Uh, so I tend to go to our best guess about the original teachings of the Buddha found in the um, Pali Canon, these collections of, of written records of his teachings. And in that record, it seems really clear that he regards practice as a process based on causes and conditions, not based on some kind of magical intervention from on high, but rather something that we earn. We earn the fruits of our practice through cultivating various causes and conditions, which include the uncovering of our deep 
Buddha nature that's already present inherently in all of us. Still, it is a developmental process that occurs dependent upon its causes and conditions. So paying attention to the causes of suffering and the causes of freedom from suffering is right at the heart of Buddhist practice. And I think also it's right at the heart of clinical psychology, my profession. Uh, it's at the heart of coaching. It's at the heart of raising children. It's really at the heart of any positive effort. How do we, how do we get good things going? You know, what are we trying to help here? And so in Buddhism, there are various lists you may know. And one of them is the seven factors of awakening or seven factors of enlightenment eventually. And those seven factors are uh, mindfulness, investigation, effort, uh, tranquility, um, concentration, bliss, and equanimity. That's a very interesting list, isn't it? In including uh, some e emotionally positive, extremely emotionally positive experiences, uh, such as tranquility and bliss, even equanimity, in which there's a deep inner stillness through which reactions flow, uh, can feel really, really good. So in this list, tranquility. And you can find tranquility also in the Buddha's mindfulness of, of breathing, sutta, in which he refers to uh, in these different multiple steps, tranquilizing the body. So it's not numbing the body or suppressing the body, but bringing tranquility, bringing peacefulness, bringing quiet to the body. And in an, in an additional step that soon follows, bringing tranquility to the mind, relaxing reactivity, releasing cares and concerns, laying down our burdens, laying it down. I, I think of the example from Mingyur Rinpoche, a great Tibetan teacher who described meditation, and it's something we can cultivate in general, like coming home from a long journey with a heavy suitcase. And when you walk through your door and you're finally home, you let the suitcase down and you just kind of plop. You plop in a nice, comfortable chair. And at least while you're plopping there, you let go. It's a, you know, there's this really sweet feeling of this. So tranquility, tranquility. When the mind becomes more tranquil, it is easier to see its nature. Also, when we're tranquil, we tend to harm other people and we tend to harm ourselves less. We don't get so aggressive and attacking toward them. We don't get so mean toward them. We get, we're less caught up in our reactions. We're tranquil, we're at peace. You can feel the ways in which we long for this, right? We long for it. Tranquility does not mean that this is the only way to be. Um, I find for myself that when I open to a feeling of tranquility and I deepen in that sense, what starts to come forward is a more of a childlike quality inside that become that is playful and delighted and interested. In other words, we can be both tranquil and alert. We can be at peace deep down inside. We can be quieter, deep down inside, while being deeply interested and awake and engaged. Now, sometimes we do need to run around. Uh, sometimes uh, we do need to get very busy and get lots of stuff done. But now I'll talk about neuropsychology and our bodies. If we do not sometimes, whew, come to rest. If we do not sometimes let it go, 
we accumulate what is called allostatic load. We gradually accumulate the wear and tear of the impact on our body of chronic weariness, chronic fatigue, chronic stress, chronic drive, chronic pressure, go, 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 go. Um, even if we kind of enjoy it a little bit, you know, we've probably all had the experience of um, going to a party or going, you know, and it's very exciting and we talk with a lot of people, but it finally is exhausting and you kind of want the guests to leave. You know, they all came to your birthday party and it was really wonderful. They brought you lots of presents, but after a few hours, you want them to go. <laughs> In some ways, it can be like that with life in general, that even if we enjoy some of our busyness, if we do not let ourselves come to rest at some point, it just gets exhausting. And um, I find much the same thing in our relationships with other people. Sometimes we just need a little space from other people to let things settle down for a while and not always have to talk about it or process this and that. Sometimes we just need to let it settle. Our bodies in evolution are designed to be at rest, actually much of the time. For example, research on hunter-gatherer bands, this is the fundamental template. This is our nature to live together as hunter-gatherers with 40 or 50 people and hunt and gather, but mainly gather. For example, generally studies on bands show that gathering brings in more calories for the band than hunting, typically. And to the extent that it is very often women in these hunter-gatherer bands who do the bulk of the gathering, I think it is really interesting that it is actually the women who are bringing in the food, mainly, uh, often, uh, with some exceptions, I'm sure, but mainly it's the women who are going out and getting the food to keep the tribe alive and the children included. I find that really kind of interesting. Still, there is some time for hunting, but other than that hunting and gathering, uh, for the rest of the time, these bands typically are resting. They're sitting around, they're talking with their kids, they're gossiping, maybe they're grooming each other a little bit. I could probably use a little grooming these days, but um, they're at rest generally. And you know how many hours it takes a typical person in a hunter-gatherer band to do their work of the day? You know, the work of gathering, the work, the work of hunting, the work of mending some of their weapons, about four hours a day. Wow typical hunter-gatherer band is at work only about four hours a day. The rest of the time, they're resting. They're conserving resources. They're conserving their calories. They're sleeping a lot. They're kind of napping. They're hanging out. Um, they're staying out of trouble. <laughs> you know, when they're resting in the cave or sitting under a tree in the shade or by the fire, they're not exposing themselves um, to predators and danger and aggression with other bands. They're, they're not at risk. It's a very sensible evolutionary strategy. So it's kind of remarkable. Um, I think the last time in my life that I was working one way or another only four hours a day on average, you know, let's say five or six days a week was maybe when I was 10 years old. <laughs> Starting in school and then summer school and then college and then adulthood and then career and all the rest of that. Wow, if you're like me, it's been a long, 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 long time since I was able to live in a way that was consistent with and natural to the evolutionary template. These days, people think that being busy, busy, busy is a badge of honor. If you're not busy, if you're not working 12 hours a day, you must not be a top performer. You must be a slacker. You must be lazy, right? That's kind of how we think about it a lot today. But in fact, that work 
pace and work load is completely unnatural and a violation of the biological template. And we see the costs of it. Yes, that's offset by modern medicine and offset by generally much better nutrition um, than a typical hunter-gatherer in the Stone Age would, could expect year after year. Okay, the two together, but still, um, you know, the amount of time we spend being busy and never really just turning off the clock and stopping really adds a lot of wear and tear on us. So I want to offer a few practical suggestions and then open it up for some discussion here. Um, the first practical suggestion is to experience at least a minute or more a day coming completely to rest. Maybe 10 breaths, about, where oh, you just let go, let down, come to rest. To do that, it can help to give yourself permission and also to remind yourself that you're safe where you are and to tell yourself that it's okay. You don't need to do anything else right now. If I have one major addiction, it is to doing. <laughs> I love getting stuff done to a fault and it can become a very intense habit. You know, when you wake up uh, in the middle of the night for some reason, maybe use the bathroom and you kind of listen to the soft murmuring of the soundtrack inside your own mind. And it's, if it's starting, if it just keeps running through different things to do, different tasks, different possibilities. It's like even when you're sleeping, your mind has not become completely quiet. So a minute or more a day of coming completely to rest. Maybe you make that part of your meditation. Uh, make, maybe you make that part of a routine, like perhaps you, um, as I'm doing these days, meditating with my wife before she goes to sleep, or you know, brushing your daughter's hair or petting a cat, you know, maybe your hand is moving while you pet the cat, but otherwise completely quiet, completely tranquil. Second big suggestion is to um, let go of repetitive planning or focusing on goals of different kinds. You know, we can often get it caught up in loops of, you know, of scanning. We're, we're scanning for problems, we're scanning for goals, we're scanning for opportunities. It's the scanning. Um, and that can become very habitual. Looking for a problem to solve, looking for a threat to deal with, looking for a pleasure to pursue, looking for something new to want, right? It's like we're perfectly content and still we're clicking through our Facebook feed or in my case, political Twitter or a shopping site, uh, just to try to find something interesting, try to find something new. It's that grasping after the next new thing. It's not restful. So here too, an opportunity in everyday life is to deliberately disengage from that and to release that quest and to be kind of aware of that feeling of quest or seeking, striving, you know. I don't mean striving in a good way, like striving to become wiser and more at peace or striving to um, help someone you love, you know, striving to do your share of the housework do the dishes. There's a place for that. I'm speaking of a kind of stressful seeking, stressful searching, stressful, um, always discontent and reaching for the next thing continually. So it's really interesting practice to let go, to be mindful of the search and to see what it's like to, to feel contented in this moment, just as it is. The last thing I would just suggest or to name as a personal practice, it's definitely something I, I think about, is the ways we put pressure on other people. 
this is different from a reasonable request or you know the expression of a longing in our heart that is vulnerable and respectful um, does not have a lot of top spin on it that's different what i'm talking about here certainly is something i'm very aware of is accelerating around other people speeding up getting pressured getting a little more intense speaking a little faster you know, being a little quick, being a little pushy, pressure, pressure on other people. That is not restful for them. And in the experience of pressure ourselves, uh, it is not restful for us either. The last suggestion I have is a little subtle and it is a lot profound. It is, I'll say it differently, it is, the rec it is to recognize the space between the thoughts. Or to put it a little differently, if this blank sheet of paper is like the field of awareness, okay, blank sheet of paper. And then if I were to mark the paper, with one thought after another. Okay, so right? So that's awareness with lots of little thoughts on it. What do we notice? Well, we notice the blue squiggles. We notice the thoughts. That's understandable. But between the thoughts and the basis of the thoughts is space is blank, it's a field, a fertile, open field of possibility. And in this way, we can recognize the field in which experiences are occurring. Hearing is occurring, thinking is occurring, wanting, remembering, planning, getting caught up in reactions, it's all happening in this field. And yet with meditative training especially, we can start to see through the figures, in a sense, the figures of our reactions to the field in which they occur. And the field is essentially unchanging. It is stable. The field is tranquil. The field is still. Waves pass through it. Experiences pass through it. But the field of, that underlies experience, the field of awareness or consciousness is in effect still. And you can have a sense of the stillness of our being through which doing flows. It's like an inherent stillness or in a sense, spaciousness, or you could say emptiness, an existent emptiness that is the ground of our experiences. And as we have a sense of that underlying stillness or space in which experiences are occurring, the space between the thoughts, the grout between the tiles of the mosaic of our stream of consciousness, um, that is a very deep and always available way to tune in to tranquility in, in our own nature. All right. So uh, I see questions coming in on the chat and I'm gonna open this up for people to, I think, raise their hands. Um, let me see how this works. I see you, Carol, have your hand raised. And very, very good. Okay, so, and I ask when you ask a question, uh, if you could please be succinct, be direct, um, and make sure it's related to what we're trying to talk about tonight. Okay, great. Okay, so Carol, yay, I can unmute you. Excellent, hi, Carol. Hi, so um, this isn't a question as much as it is an, um, an acknowledgement. 
Um, I'm in Tucson, Arizona. I'm an old friend of Joseph from Bogaya days and Jack and Sharon from Naropa days. Mm -hmm. And I've been meditating for 50 years. And I and Jungian analysis and um, body work and the whole nine yards. And I'm a tranquility junkie. But I've always noticed this underlying anxiety, sometimes big, sometimes little, that isn't going away. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, maybe I'm just going to die an anxious person. Nothing is really taking that away. And suddenly, because of your offering with Joseph and, um, and All right. um, I come upon Rick Hansen. And so I Google around and I hear a few TED talks and talk at Google and whatever. And I, and I hear all about the three levels of the brain and the um, jar with the green balls and the red ball. <laughs> and, you know, I'm 77. You have framed it in an aha moment. I no longer think that I'm something uh, unrepairable. I'm just being a reptilian person and you've given me some tools to address that. So I just want to say thank you very much. And um, I will continue to join your meditations. Oh, thank you, Carol, and welcome and bravo and such an experienced person as you joining us. I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And if I may use myself as an example of one more way to become more tranquil, uh, I will now mute you, not out of disrespect, okay, just for simplicity here. Uh, I noticed for myself that when Carol said those really sweet acknowledging things, a longing in myself which is partly natural to, I think, all of us as social primates, and also is particular to me given my childhood, a little bit of a longing to be seen and appreciated. So normal, so human, so hard to admit, especially for many people, and still so natural. That longing was relieved when Carol said that. And I think that's an example of many opportunities in the day to actually experience that a longing is satisfied or that a goal has been, in the moment at least, attained so we can afford to feel that we've arrived and to let go of the quest, the stressful striving for more and to actually take it in which is a way of getting more and more of those green balls inside our brain. How, you know, just ask ourselves, how often as we go through our day, do we let ourselves experience relief and reassurance and arriving? And when we experience that, Carol, by the way, anxiety dissipates. As we truly experience arriving, including arriving in each moment and arriving with another person who really is listening, are really appreciating, you know, it's a relief and anxiety fades away again and again and again. So, great. I want to uh, take a look at the chats coming in. Um, okay, great. I'm seeing comments coming in from people that are that are helpful. Um, so that's great in general. Um, great, 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 good, great. Okay, good. How about it? I'll bounce around another person. Did I see, so, Trisha, by any chance, did you had your hand, have your hand raised? Nope. Okay. So anybody want to make a comment or ask a question? How to stay tranquil when you're watching the news? All right, that would be a good one. Okay, let's start there with Jed. That may not be your question, Jed, but I'm going to unmute you. Hi there. Hi. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, earlier in your talk, you used a phrase I wasn't 
familiar with, I'm not sure I quite understand the meaning. You uh, referred to a Buddha nature, and I, ah. I don't know what that is. Okay. Well, that. Thank you. It, I mean, one thing I'm registering is not to do that again <laughs> 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 because it's unclear. So, um, well, so there are different ways of relating to this. So one simple way is in the original meaning of the word Buddha or Budo, and it means basically one who knows. So um, a simple way to understand this is to recognize the, the natural place inside or witnessing inside that really just does know. And I don't know about you, but for me, I can experience, I have different ideas, I have different points of view. And deep down, it's like there's a place inside me that always knows what's true and doesn't believe my BS and doesn't believe their BS either and is naturally wakeful, naturally knowing, naturally wise. And people talk about that in different ways, like the, the, the inner voice or the, the, you know, the, the angel on one shoulder. That's one way to understand that. Buddha nature, in terms of its wakefulness, uh, a second way to understand it is a natural compassion or lovingness in us, kind of a fundamental ground of benevolence, of caring, of kindness. So these are two very direct ways in ordinary reality that we can understand our own deep nature. Uh, I would add also that as a, someone who grew up, uh, I did, um, it was hard for me to feel like a good person. And over time in adulthood, I've kind of worked to install the green ball uh, in my brain, as it were, of feeling like a basically good person and to include a fundamental kind of um, sort of goodness or innocence or sweetness in the core of one's being. Uh, we can see that in other people, you know, we can see it deep down inside them. Can we recognize that, that sweetness, that goodness, that innocence, that purity? I think of the water. Water can hold many poisons, but water itself is always pure. Right? Every single molecule of hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, is inherently just H2O. Um, it's inherently what it is. In a sense, it's inherently pure. And um, so that's the kind of minimal way to understand that. And um, I think uh, in each person, there's a, there's a sense of letting, when we let down, that's one thing that happens when we become more and more tranquil. We come home to ourselves, the noise gets quieter. It's like the noise, the distraction, the dust in our eyes, it gets quieter. We come home to who we really are. And then who are we when we are who we really are? Uh, deep down, when people are not in great pain, they're not hungry, they're not desperate, most people have a sense that who they really are is aware, kind, and in some fundamental sense, pure. That's a really good thing. And it's good to find people around whom we can just really let down and be who we are. And then ultimately to finish, an, a further way possibly, if you like, to understand Buddha nature. Uh, the term Buddha nature really came in after the Buddha died. And um, it is more of a way of, of looking at things that came in with Tibetan Buddhism and, and Zen and Chan Buddhism. Um, it, it's a way of possibly uh, intuiting that uh, our deepest nature in some way partakes of the transcendental, partakes of something that is beyond ordinary reality. And that is not required. Uh, and uh, as the Buddha taught, you know, see for yourself what rings true for you. Uh, but for some people, that sense of Buddha nature in a mysterious and profound way points to something um, that seems infinite, transpersonal. Uh, yeah. Uh, what do you make of all that, Chad? What do you, was that clear? What do you think? Uh, a lot there to unpack. Um, 
the, thank you for that definition. Uh, I think that getting to that core nature, I guess, is sort of the goal of, of uh, yeah. the mindfulness practices. Yeah, good way to put it. And interestingly, also to see it in others. I mean, it yeah. can really be a practice to recognize whatever you think of as that, you know, don't, you know, essence, spirit, Buddha nature in other people, you know, deep down. Uh, so that, that's a practice too. Okay, good. Well, thank you, Jed. Thank you very much. Great. And, and as always, if I ever say anything that doesn't make sense or you don't know what in the world I'm talking about, good. Raise your hand. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, great. Uh, let's see, Gail, I'm gonna unmute you. Hi, so I have an idea that helps me with tranquility and I'm curious what you think of it. And it has to do with softening focus. Mm. So an example would be I'd look out in my backyard and I think, oh, how pretty this little section of my yard looks. And I can just look at it and it seems very peaceful. Yeah. But the minute I get closer, I see, oh, there's a weed here. What is this <laughs> doing here? And I get all upset about it that I'm not tranquil anymore. So I guess to me, there's something about softening your focus or seeing things in a bigger way that makes, makes me feel more tranquil than really focusing down in on it. Well, um, thank you for sharing that. And um, I'd like to make a comment about that that has some cool neurology in it. And also uh, uh, respond to a question that has come in from uh, Nine Sean and Bruce Malloy about the news these days, which seems really relevant. So I'll speak to that too. So Gail, if it's okay, I'll, I'll meet you again. And um, so uh, it is true on the one hand that as we, focus attention in a concentrated way on just one stimulus narrowly, like the feeling of breathing or the feeling of breathing at the upper lip, or to really zero in on a single grain of sand or blade of grass, the mind tends to become more tranquil. It tends to become more concentrated. And that's a meditative technique. So on the one hand, as we as um, a teacher of mine once put it, as we become devoted to the object of attention and renounce everything else, we can become more concentrated and there's a stillness that occurs in which, uh, which supports penetrating, liberating insight on the one hand. I agree with you though, on the other hand, when we start to scan this and this, this and that, uh, we see things to fix. We see what's wrong. I mean, it, the way you talk sounds like what happens in my mind when I look out in my backyard. I go, oh, light, nice, nice, like it, like it. Huh. Got to fix that. <laughs> What's wrong? <laughs> Why is that plant brown? <laughs> is, is the watering broken? You know what I mean? Da, 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 da. So that's understandable. And that's why neurology time now, it's really helpful to widen out into the sense of things as a whole. And one of the things that really was, a, for me, really interesting and new when I was kind of working on my book here uh, was the ways in which when we get a sense of things as a whole, that quiets activity in the midline cortex of the brain, both the frontal regions that are very task-oriented and the rear regions that are mind-wandering default mode network. And that activity gets quieter when we have a sense of things as a whole. And we tend to engage networks on the sides of the brain, especially the right hemisphere for right-handed right people, because the right hemisphere is involved with the sense of things as a whole. And as we engage the right hemisphere, it's connected in a seesaw, like a seesaw with the left hemisphere, which is doing sequential uh, problem solving which is the basis for verbal activity. So when we go into things as a whole, we decrease stressful activity in the midline, which is also involved in mental time travel, future and past. We really come into the present moment, which 
interrupts and disrupts a lot of worry and a lot of rumination and a lot of regretting. And um, quiets verbal activity, which is also very involved in a lot of stressing. Isn't it interesting? The simple act of getting a sense of your body as a whole or the room as a whole or the whole situation maybe, the totality of the current moment with the coronavirus and the world and human history and biology, just all of it. In a funny way, when you go out into it as a whole and you disengage from this part and that part, you go out into it as a whole, you become more tranquil. You feel less stressed by it and less beleaguered by it, less attacked by it, you know? That's really powerful. So I, that's something I've been really practicing a lot of, how to actually get a sense of things as a whole, which includes disengaging from one's own righteous point of view. That's a good practice. Disengaging from our own perspective. Don't know. Wow. Who knew? (laughs) That's good. Uh, I'm not saying this is the only way to live. Sometimes we have to be analytic. Sometimes we have to act on parts. You know, okay, there's a place for that. But I don't know. I think most people would say they're doing much too much of that these days. They feel burdened by it. It becomes a habit. It's tiring. Uh, There's a reason why it's tiring. We're not meant to do that all day long, right? So now about the news, I wanted to just comment that, I, you know, Uh, what's been helpful for me lately about the news and politics and the current moment and all that is to sort things into three piles. First, there is the pile of being informed, being interested, uh, having uh, a, a moral opinion about what's good and what's bad and what should happen and what should not happen, you know, all that. Okay, that's one pile. Then there's another pile, which is simply compassion. And it's interesting how the first pile tends to crowd out compassion. Even though in the first pile, including outrage, feeling appalled, feeling infuriated about how so many people are being hurt, let's say, even though that part of that first pile can feel virtuous and feel like it's good for everyone, still that kind of preoccupation and outrage and disgust and fury, all of which I can relate to, gets in the way of compassion. Compassion is not agreement, but it's like we need to make room for compassion. Compassion for those who are sick, compassion for those who are dying, compassion for those who are out of work, compassion for those who are scared, compassion for the people we live with, who are tired of living with us, <laughs> right? Compassion. We need to, that's the second pile the, and to make room for that. And then the third pile is practical action that we actually can take in our circle of the world for ourselves, our friends, our family, you know, how we will eventually vote, where we will try to send some money if we can, um, what we will make for dinner tonight, how we will wash our hands and be careful, uh, what we will enjoy meanwhile, uh, right? The action we will take now, how we will set aside a little time every day to become completely tranquil. That's in the third pile. See those three piles? And I think if you're like me, I have spent way too much time in the first pile lately, way too much time way beyond anything that's helpful. And um, I think it's important to make room for the second and third pile of compassion and simply practical action. So now I I want to do something kind of quickly here, if it's okay with you. I'm gonna keep going a little long, both because I want to hear from Madison Kane and Julian Smith, and then I will bring this main meeting to an end and surprise for those who want, those who are still here two minutes after I end the main meeting, 
uh, in Zoom, I can randomly assign you to groups of three or four people. And so if you want, you will be just put in a group with three or four people and you can talk to each other to support the third jewel of Buddhist practice, Sangha. Sangha, a sense of community with each other. You don't have to do it. And if you start talking with people and you don't really want to keep going, you can just say that and leave that Zoom meeting. If you wanna talk longer with those people, and I'm gonna set a timer at about 20 minutes and it will count down and it will automatically end then. If you wanna connect with each other after the Zoom meeting, um, you can make arrangements to do that. You know, If you wanna give your personal information to the other person and maybe create a, a Zoom meeting on your own or just get on a conference call with each other. And we will figure this out better and better and I'll give you more warning next time, all right, in terms of this possibility, okay? And like so many things, it's kind of an experiment. But first I wanna go back to Madison, or which screen are you in? All right, Madison. So again, Madison and Julian, sorry, I've gone a little long here, so be especially succinct, all right. And I will be too. All right, Madison. <laughs> Hi, Rick. Thank you. Um, just a, a little testimony. Screaming back pain when I started the meditation. And I thought, this isn't going to work. And I spent my entire meditation in resentment of what had contributed to the back pain. And when the meditation was done, much of the back pain was lifted um, with a commentary of total resentment. So I, I don't know how the hell that happened, but, but <laughs> thank you. Other very quick thing is a million years ago, you used to show an animation and I feel like I need to see it again and I need to deeply understand it of the warrior who kept batting against either the bees or the flies. Yeah. Because I feel like um, without bursting into tears that it's a commentary of how I'm living my life. And I think I didn't it was more than just that the guy stopped swatting and then everything got quiet. I think there was another lesson to it. So that that was it. To maybe see that that bee or the fly thing again or to to um to get that message a little deeper. Oh, I appreciate that. And I will show that uh, wonderful short uh, little mini movie next time. It's about equanimity. It's about equanimity, which um basically means to find a place inside, which I think is more important these days than ever. And also the more that our back hurts or the more that our heart is heavy or whatever it might be, the more we worry about money, the more important it is to get in touch with an authentic place inside of serenity. Around which the flies are buzzing around which there may be pain, there may be worry, anger, but there is a, a place inside we can all find that feels serene, that feels independent of all that, so that both things are true. There is an in touchness in that place inside all of us that feels fundamentally at peace even while all these other th craziness is going through the mind. And it takes practice. It takes practice, certainly. Uh, that's why we practice. That's why we train. That's why it's important to practice. But um, I think of the quote from John Cage, the, mu the musician, that real music, I'm paraphrasing, is the silence between the notes. I'm speaking about the silence, the quiet between the notes of our experiences and becoming more and more aware of that underlying stillness, which is not changing. You know, impermanence passes, but it feels timeless and vast. And who knows, it may partake of something transcendentally um, timeless and unconditioned and still. But developing an intuition of this, if only for a moment, you know, as soon as you start thinking about it, you're not in it. 
right? And But more and more, there can be a sense of a kind of background, stillness, or tranquility, or equanimity, uh, even while we're busy or upset. And that is a very important thing to develop. So, okay. Um, thanks. I wish you well, Madison, and good luck with your back. You know, I know how invasive that can be. All right, Julian, uh, I'm going to unmute you. Great. Thanks, Julian. And hello again. How are you doing? Um, so I'm, I'm going uh, to make this quick. I'm in the middle of basically trying to flip my life around, kind of go on a new path and just all this stuff. I've been I'm emailing you back and forth, but just trying to do a whole new life change, basically. And so there's so much stuff to think about. Yeah. There's a whole whirling around in my head and on paper and I'm just thinking about it all the time. So I, I'm spiraling, like you were saying, talking about before, you know, try not to spiral and and I'm doing that, and I know that it's not, I shouldn't be spiraling. It's happening anyways, right? So, you know, take take a, some time to yourself, take a breath, do some breath work, go out in nature, calm down for a little bit, et cetera, right? But I know I need to do that. I, I actually am scheduling time to meditate into my schedule because it's so hectic, so I know I need to drop some things. But the problem is... Um, you know, I meditate, I, I do whatever I need to do to chill out and calm down. And this thing, this all these lists of things I need to do become this source of anxiety again. So I can be calm now for a few minutes. I got to go back to this list of stuff that I have to do and it becomes this whole source of anxiety. And the, the tendency when something's a source of anxiety is you want to avoid it, right? Which is probably good when that source of anxiety is the news or something like that right but maybe not so great when it's all the things i need to do for my future yeah. so i'm just i'm kind of like i don't even know if this is a question but i'm kind of kind of yeah. struggling with like how do i remain productive right and not have these things that i want to do become this sort of anxiety for me and where i'm like physically not wanting to dive back into it again yeah, totally. Um, and it's something I can very much relate to. So I'm going to offer some very personal, practical suggestions from my own history here and see if they fit for you, okay? Um, to kind of repeat what I said uh, to Madison a moment ago, one thing we can develop, and it, we develop it, we train, you know, and it's okay. It's understandable if you just can't do it like that, Right. I'm still working on it myself, but it's to have a growing feeling, I'm gonna say it a certain way, of being the quiet in which noise happens, right? Being the stillness in which activity is occurring. That's a sense we can develop increasingly over time. That's a very general comment. But, you know, uh, there can be a, a, another way of saying it is a knowing that underlies all the details of our mental activities. Just an underlying knowing. Like, for example, Julian, a knowing that you're doing the right thing. You are giving yourself over to good purposes. You are honorably, nobly stepping forward in life. There can be that underlying knowing as the container of doubt, doing, tasks, checklists, how do I prioritize, you know, da, 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 da. That's a general statement. Specifically, um, I'll tell you two things that have been very blunt for me and noble, just see if you relate to them. One is to um, know that when you go through your day, you are, you are doing the most important things. And you are focusing on what, in other words, what's the best use of the next minute? What's the best use of the next hour? Best being your decision and best taking into account lots of other things. Like sometimes I'll have to spend the next hour doing um, something that is a fair, you know, is. I wish I didn't have to do it, 
right? You know, or it's just, it's just a low priority, but I have to do it. I had to fill out some tax forms related to our retirement earlier today. It was very complicated. It was messy. It was a pain in the zorch. I had to do it, you know, but it was the best use of my time because I finally took care of it and it was done, right? So to make sure that you are, um, um, it's like work, you know, you're doing a good job each day. And did I do a good job this hour? Or did I space out, go online, beat myself up, you know, organize my drawer when instead I should have really been doing something else? And be honest with yourself. And, and, and then take refuge in the relief of knowing that you um, did the best you could, right? Like that's that doubt, you know, doubt is, uh, there are five hindrances in Buddhism. I'll talk about that another time. And some, maybe the worst is doubt because everything can be doubted. We can always doubt ourselves. So it never ends. And that quality of self-doubt, I'm kind of hearing in what you're saying. So just know to yourself that you did a good day's work today and then right. do it again tomorrow and do it again every day. And to know that and to feel that it's old school, but there's no replacement for it, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I joke with my kid, I, kids. I say nothing digs ditches like shovel fulls of dirt. <laughs> you know, just know that. And then take refuge in knowing I'm, I'm digging that ditch one shovel full at a time. No bull. Do that. And then um, the other strong suggestion I have is have a time every day when you clock out. Where you say to yourself, what is, what time is it? Eight o'clock, nine o'clock, seven o'clock, six o'clock. Done. It's like a factory. I worked in a bottling plant uh, down in Watts in LA, you know, when I was in college for a little while. And uh, I loved, you know, I, it was hard work. You were lifting things all day long and uh, it was hard work. Um, boy, was it such a relief to put my time card in the machine and hear the sound of that. Kutunk. <laughs> and I had clocked out. So make sure there's a time every day, especially if you're self-employed or if you're trying to develop a new career or explore new kinds of training, make sure you put a clock out. For, that's it today, clocked out. Whatever I did today, that's what I did today. And whoosh, that's it. Tomorrow's another day. And, and to give yourself that and draw that line. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully that's useful anyway. It, uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> okay. All right, great. And well, I'll tell you one last thing, Nod, just yeah. to, to go hardcore for a second here. All tasks are empty. Yeah. They can feel so brick-like and so burdensome, but if we look closely at them, they are, this is where the inside of the Buddha into shunyata or emptiness is so useful that they exist, but they're impermanent. They're made of parts. You know, they're like local threads in the tapestry of reality. And you can start to get a sense that all tasks are empty. It doesn't mean they're void. It doesn't mean they're trivial or not worth doing. Saving a life is a task. It's, em it's, it's important and vital and it is still empty, which can shift our relationship to it. And with insight, with growing Vipassana, you can have that recognition uh, that all tasks are empty. That's a little hardcore, but I thought I'd throw that in for the hardcore <laughs> part in every person. <laughs>